द वे फॉरवर्ड इज थोड़ा बहुत बहुत स्वागत है मैं थोड़ा होस्ट हरजोत सिंह सब तो पहला साढ़े सारे व्यूअर्स को नवे साल की बहुत बहुत मुबारक असी अज नवा साल शुरू करा एक अचीवमेंट की स्टोरी नाल एक सक्सैस की स्टोरी नाल एक होप की स्टोरी नाल साडे अज मौजूद हैं साढ़े एक होनहार यूथ शमतेज सिंह राणा शमतेज थोड़ा बहुत बहुत स्वागत है सत श्रीकाल शमतेज जी हैज रीसेंटली बीन एक्सैप्टेड टू द प्रस्टीजियस जॉन हॉपकिनस स्कूल ऑफ मेडिसिन जिथे ए न्यूरो साइंस पढ़ा he has been uh, uh, selected for a full scholarship program aaj assi inna nal gal karange us application process de bare ch taki oh sade baaki jehde aspiring uh, sade community de bachche n unna nu vi path dikha sakan shamtej ji first of all congratulations for this achievement thank you sanu uh, tell tell us something so so uh, what, what is it that we are celebrating today um so high school's finished mm -hmm. almost um i've been selected into a some would say extremely prestigious uh neuroscience program at Johns Hopkins mm -hmm. and i guess we're celebrating that this hard work that i've been putting myself through mm -hmm. these last 4 years they've mm -hmm. succeeded mm -hmm. and it's going to look good no it's an amazing achievement uh tell us something about yourself first were, were you born in new york Yeah, I was born uh in Jamaica Hospital Medical Center. Mm -hmm. Um a few uh decade ago and now uh I was born and raised in Forest Hills in Queens. Mm -hmm. Uh I used to go to Richmond Hill Gurdwara. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh after a while uh at the start of my high school we moved to Long Island, a place called Comac and there I started looking into the sciences and I figured out that I wanted to be a neurologist and mm -hmm. So here we are. T tell us something about your family background. Is there anyone in the field of medicine or um what are they into? on my mom's side of the family there's uh her twin brothers. Mm -hmm. They they're doctors and one of them's a professor. He teaches medicine. Um but there isn't there hasn't really been a strong uh, medical sort of person in our family mm -hmm. and they're It was sort of like my parents who they like struggled coming to the United States and it was sort of their dream to see me become a doctor and so mm -hmm. I'm sort of paving the mm -hmm. way towards that. Mm -hmm. And uh I hope it was your dream as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and how how did that dream come into being? How did you decide do you want to be a did you always want to be a neurosurgeon? Well, when when I was much much younger, um it was me like every other kid's dream to do something fun mm -hmm. and obviously if you ask a uh, a kid in elementary school right now you ask him like what's fun to you he's not going to immediately say doctor but it was sort of my my mother in 5th grade she would tell me you're going to become a gynecologist and i didn't understand what that was mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and so she said it's the it's the doctor that helps deliver babies mm -hmm. like the most important doctor because they help deliver babies mm -hmm. and i i sort of went with that because i was like okay well it's my mom she knows what's going on mm -hmm. and so i went with that idea and then in middle school i sort of learned what a gynecologist actually was and <laughs> that was kind of an embarrassing moment <laughs> all right <laughs> and um It was actually then that I started looking at other parts of the health field and they sort of like my parents had this idea that they want they they first put this pressure on me that you should find a a job that you want to do that will earn you a lot of money because they had these struggles that they went through because they didn't have the best jobs and they didn't have the job security mm -hmm. like you would find in the medical field mm -hmm. and so from that there was sort of this pressure on me to become a doctor or do something important mm -hmm. and as i grew up in middle school i started looking at the aspects of medicine and what in there i truly thought was something i could do mm -hmm. and i came across a few books that i was reading mm -hmm. um in terms of like educating myself and neurology was just something that stuck with me because i saw all of these cases of like all these strange cases of like different symptoms symptoms that scientists didn't understand and i thought what better thing could i be doing than 
try and help people who might have these symptoms. Mm -hmm. So you, you were telling me uh, earlier about this book that had a lot of influence on you, yeah. uh, where uh, this person had did not have an arm and mm -hmm. his brain would tell him that he could use an arm. Yeah. Can you share that story with us? Um, the book was Phantoms in the Brain by uh, V.S. Ramachandran, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I might be wrong. Uh, and the idea was about these things called phantom limbs. Mm -hmm. And it was so if someone was, normally it's not if you were born without a limb or something. It was if it was removed at some point of your life, it was amputated. Um, like veterans would have these feelings where they wouldn't have their arm after it was amputated, but they would still feel it. Mm -hmm. And they would still, they would say like, my arm, I have my arm, it's in a weird position. Mm -hmm. And it would give them pain and it wouldn't let them sleep. And they would like, they would feel the ability to move their fingers, even though they didn't have an arm or mm -hmm. like wiggle their toes if they didn't have a leg. And what uh, happened was that, uh, so Dr. Ramachandran, he came up with a experiment mm -hmm. to try and move those arms. And he found like if you block off that portion of, that, of the person's body mm -hmm. and you moved like a figure, mm -hmm. then a, like a shape of an arm next to it, it would feel as though it was their own arm. And he sort of started looking at the ways in which you could trick the brain mm -hmm. into feeling things that weren't actually happening. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways he could make people's amputated arms move mm. to them. And I, like, that, I thought that was really inspiring because there was like veterans who served their country and mm -hmm. they like gave all these sacrifices and then they were struggling with this pain and no one else could figure out a solution for it. And then he did. And mm -hmm. I sort of thought that was inspiring. And, and, and that was something which laid the foundation for your interest in neuroscience. Yeah, that was, the, that was the first book. And then I started reading on from there. And mm -hmm. there was a lot of other things that mm -hmm. started to critique my interest. Mm -hmm. uh, Shamteji, a uh, uh, selection process mm -hmm. for a school like uh, John Hopkins, it's, it's very competitive. Mm -hmm. so, so can you tell us uh, wh what do you think uh, makes a strong application for these schools? Uh, yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of people, you'll ask them and they'll say, oh, it's all about academics or it's all about your grades and you have to do good in school. And <laughs> I think that although that is a good um, thing that sets you apart from a crowd, it's more about what impact you're making mm -hmm. to like the community around you and who like who you have bonds with and the story that you've developed for yourself over mm -hmm. the course of your life. Mm -hmm. um, for for a lot of people that I know, there's this um, stress of like uh, f figure out these academics, but there's no uh, like extracurricular activity mm -hmm. that is defining who they are. Um, for me, it was uh, fencing and um, the Guru Nanak Darbar's soup kitchen, mm -hmm. the Monday night one. Um, mm -hmm. It was experiences in both those places and my research and work experience mm -hmm. in, during summers in between uh, high school grades that sort of set me apart from the rest of the, ac ap the applicant pool. Mm -hmm. There was, if say a school such as Hopkins, which is prestigious takes, mm -hmm. it has like this big group of kids to look at and they all have great SAT scores and mm -hmm. great um, high school scores and all of this um, that is the same. They want, they, they want to look for kids who will come to their campus mm -hmm. and will bring a change, something positive to their campus. Mm -hmm. And so I think that anybody who's planning on applying, they should find something that they're good at and they're passionate about, mm -hmm. and that should be a focus throughout their application. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, when does this process begin? At what time of the year? And so I started my college process at the end of 10th grade. At the end I, of 10th grade? Yeah, okay. at the end of 10th grade, I started researching colleges that had programs in the field that I wanted to study. Mm -hmm. And I looked for where I had my best chances of applying and where I had my worst. And, uh, and at that time, you were pretty decided on neuroscience? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, it's okay if like you don't have a decision on what you want to major in, but you should know what general field you, you want to be looking into. At least you know that you want yeah. to be a doctor. 
Yeah. Okay. Like if you know you want to do something science or medicine related, mm -hmm. you're applying to a different set of schools than mm -hmm. someone who's doing literature or history. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I, I, st I knew beforehand that I was going to do something medical or in the sciences and that's when I started um, looking into schools such as Johns Hopkins mm -hmm. and I took this long list of like 35 schools and I condensed it mm -hmm. into what schools I thought I had the best chance of getting into. Mm -hmm. uh, Shamte ji will talk more about this after a short break. So see Vigdero, the way forward. The way forward is thought of her to Swagata, Matt or the host Harjot Singh. Aj Asigal Karea, Shamte Singh Rana Jinal, Jo Ek community, the young secular uh, Kehege who has been accepted uh, into a neuroscience program at the prestigious John Hopkins program. Uh, John, John Hopkins uh, University. Right, let's go. Yeah. Uh, Shamtej, for our kids who are uh, right now uh, in the ninth, 10th standard, 11th standards, right? Uh, I understand before the t mostly ninth and 10th standards, what is it that they should start doing uh, which can make strengthen their applications to these schools? So a good thing to get ahead on is your influence in the community. So some students do it through in-school clubs, some students do it through their church or their gurdwara, mm -hmm. um, some kids do it through some sort of work experience, mm -hmm. but there should always be something that you're doing that will teach you something new. So mm -hmm. even if it's a research opportunity or if it's working at a local restaurant, something that will teach you how to work with other people or mm -hmm. some, some new skill. Mm -hmm. um, for me, uh, I worked at a manufacturing firm mm -hmm. uh, in Farmingdale. Okay. And what I did was I was working with another group of students and working with their manufacturing portion of their company and we were coming up with ways to make the work that was happening on their factory floor more efficient. Mm -hmm. So when I talked about that in my application, I sort of brought interest to the skills that I developed there, the mm -hmm. like learning to code and working with a group of people and how to solve like these complex problems. Mm -hmm. And I think that any student, uh, like any anyone really who's looking to shine against other students on their application, it's mm -hmm. something like that that they have to do. Um, in school clubs, running for officer positions, mm -hmm. becoming the president of like a human rights club or some sort of school initiative mm -hmm. that brings emphasis to your role as a leader mm -hmm. in your community. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. Yeah, so it's not just uh, pure academics uh, which influence your application. They see uh, your, how motivated you are, how dedicated you are, yeah. how, uh, how you know, passionate you are mm -hmm. about, about your interests. Uh, uh, Shamteji, one thing uh, I would like you to throw some light upon is, you know, these schools are expensive, mm -hmm. right? And uh, we understand there are some scholarship uh, programs like the Quest Bridge or Posse. Uh, did, did you uh, get the benefit of any of these scholarships? or? Um, so I didn't apply through any program such as like Quest Bridge or Posse, but I, Johns Hopkins was a special um, it, it had a special place on my list because they recently got a donation mm -hmm. from the from Bloomberg. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they got a very large um, amount of money that they were supposed to use for infrastructure and mm -hmm. education and for financial aid for mm -hmm. students such as me who wouldn't be able to go to the school if I didn't receive some sort of aid. Mm -hmm. And so things like that, It's sometimes it's dependent on how much your family's making or what their financial status is. Mm -hmm. um, in my case, my family doesn't have the best financial status. Mm -hmm. So because of that, I got some aid from the government mm -hmm. through FAFSA and CSS. Okay. And those are applications that most students should fill out regardless of their mm -hmm. um, financial state because it'll help some way. Mm -hmm. um, 
the Hopkins gave me uh, money to go to the school um, just from that Bloomberg donation mm -hmm. uh, because of my financial situation and because of my academics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's why I received mm -hmm. financial aid. And for uh, for availing those other scholarships like Boston and Quest, as mm -hmm. you just mentioned, uh, is there a process involved? Uh, do they do they make these applications like beforehand? How, how does that work? Uh, I don't know much about Posse, but for QuestBridge, I know that most colleges will have their application for the college and financial aid due around November, December for an early decision application. Okay. Which is, a, it's like ahead of a time. Mm -hmm. It's like a big commitment applica um, application because if you get in, you're required to go by okay. law. Mm -hmm. um, but for QuestBridge, it's, they expect it in, I think it's early September, mid-September, mm -hmm. um, and that's, I think the way that works is they look at your financial circumstance and they look at your grades and they match you up with schools mm -hmm. and you make a list of schools that you would consider going to and then they give you a 100% scholarship for one of those schools if you get accepted. Mm -hmm. uh, Shamtej, if, if we talk about... Uh, you know, guidance for our youngsters, for, uh, you know, knowing about these programs, knowing about the scholarships and helping them with their applications. What would you say uh, is the best resource? Is it like something in the community? Is it your school teachers? Or is it something else you took benefit of? A good place to go to start off if you need a general idea, I would say is really just uh, start by searching uh, like Google and get a general idea of how college admissions and uh, financial aid work. Mm -hmm. Start by like watching YouTube videos, like figuring out, like create a foundation for yourself mm -hmm. and then go to your guidance office in your high school or talk to your teachers and they can give you a more specific plan and they can help you plan mm -hmm. it out. How, how helpful were the teachers at your school with, with your achievement? Uh, well, a lot of my um, teachers would point out the colleges that they've gone to or the programs that they've heard of, mm -hmm. and they would point out that um, it was it'd be a good idea to apply to those programs. Mm -hmm. um, fellow students would also, mm -hmm. like uh, upperclassmen who got into college recently, mm -hmm. they would tell you what programs they got into, how they applied, and you would learn from them. Mm -hmm. But I think definitely my like guidance counselor and our guidance department, they helped me plan out how I was going to go about applying and mm -hmm. what steps I had to take mm -hmm. that I couldn't find information on online mm -hmm. in order to. Did, did they help you with your application, with your essay and all that stuff? Yeah, um, for my Common App essay and for my uh, supplemental essays mm -hmm. for Johns Hopkins, uh, I had teachers read them and review them and give me feedback. Mm -hmm. And I think that it helped a lot because it helped me figure out what I was telling to the admissions officers who would be reviewing my application. Mm -hmm. And that helped me send the right message so that I look like a better applicant. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Shamtej, at, at this stage, uh, which is uh, you know, right after your high school, does your work experience uh, matter in your application? Yeah, I definitely think so. Um, because the work experience that I had was a lot of research-based um, stuff, uh, I think that finding research opportunities and mentorships in college will mm -hmm. be much easier. Mm -hmm. I'll have like a foundation in like figuring things out instead of learning them that I think uh, mentors and researchers will see as a positive aspect of taking me in as a research student. Mm -hmm. And uh, we understand John Hopkins has a huge focus on research yeah. uh, you know, along with pure academics, right? Uh, there's something else I would like to ask you. We, we feel very proud and very happy to see you um, in, in this room. Ha, has that worked in, in either way? Have you ever felt any hindrance or has it helped you in any way? How, how does that work? Um, I think in some, I think it does both. In academic settings mm -hmm. where I'm with a group of people who uh, like are academics and are smart and uh, aren't, don't have like any aspect of ignorance. They see it as some sort of balance or some structure to my life that mm -hmm. uh, can be taken positively and can be seen as uh, a person with a good work ethic. Mm -hmm. um, but on, in other cases, like um, sometimes with peers and uh, 
in my like journey through high school, I've had issues where other students didn't understand the importance of uh, my identity and the way I look. Um, and like I've been in like fights, I've been in arguments, there's been problems that have stemmed from it, but I think that overall I've learned that um, showing this identity is something that helps me stay ahead in a sense and it helps me find the good in people mm -hmm. who might be ignorant or don't understand mm -hmm. Sikhi the way that I hope that they might one day mm -hmm. and I think that it's important for uh, kids of our faith to continue to look through to look past the problems that may come may arise from their identity and use it as something that strengthens who they are instead of weakens it. Shamte ji, asi tordna re gal jari rakhange ek chote ji break de baad. So see, wake the the way forward. The way forward is toda fir to swagat hai. Main toda host Harjot Singh. Aaj asi gal kar rahe hain Shamte ji, Shamte Jrana ji nal. Uh, who has been accepted to uh, a neuroscience program at prestigious John Hopkins University. Or Shamte ji aage jaake ek neurosurgeon banna chandin. Inna de man vich isle kuch sawaal an process de baare ch. Or asi aaj invite kita hai ek neurologist, Dr. Kavneet Korjinu, who is a board certified neurologist and uh, presently doing her fellowship in vascular neurology. Dr. Saab, you are very welcome. Thank you. Shamtej Ji, you have a question for some questions about your future processes. We thought that if you have given the answers to the TV, so that the rest of the age group of the young people can get this guidance. So, Dr. Saab, you have a question for the key step after four years of college. What would be the next step for him to go into that line? So right now talking about four years of uh, college and then pursuing medical school, mm -hmm. which part is missing, I'm coming from India. So after we do our 12th, we go directly to our medical school. Mm -hmm. But here you have to go through that process. Mm -hmm. So application of medical school and then finishing up med medical school and then looking forward for residency and then fellowship training. So process of medical school training is different than applying for residency. Mm -hmm. I, I think I can talk more about after medical school, mm -hmm. what is the process, because that's when I came to United States and, mm -hmm. and my experience started. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's where uh, we have seen, I, I being a layman, I, I've seen most of our, uh, at least the people I, I personally know, str uh, struggle with their residences and observerships and rotations. I, I don't know what those things are. And I, c can you tell us, uh, so after uh, we finish the medical school, right? So you have to go for a re uh, residency? After medical school, you are looking for residency. Okay, and is that a competitive uh, process? It is definitely a competitive program mm -hmm. these days. Okay. So, uh, depending on what field you want to go to, it mm -hmm. gets uh, tougher and tougher. Mm -hmm. But I would say that the process here and in any country starts when you are in medical school because you have to plan your clerkships accordingly, what field you're interested in. And as you are doing your clerkships, you have to figure out what you are interested in and what you want to pursue in your life. Mm -hmm. So for that... Uh, I'm sorry, what is this clerkship? So clerkship are your clinical rotations. And okay. those are started, I think, after second year of med school or end of second year. Um, that's what we started at the end of second year in India. So does the school help or you uh, arrange that yourself? School helps and there are options of electives which you can choose on your own. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, every school gives you option because with that rotation, you will see that really what you're interested in, do you really like it? 
So mm -hmm. that makes a big of a difference because just reading from the books is different and going through the clinical rotation, seeing those patients is completely different because... So, so, so you mean uh, they would uh, go through different departments like uh, neurology and eyes and gynecology yep. and all so, that stuff? Yeah. Okay. So I, I always say the students who rotate with me when I was doing my residency is the first step is you have to figure out medical versus surgical field. Mm -hmm. Have you decided do you like medical field or do you like surgical field? Mm -hmm. I personally say when I was in medical school I always knew that I'm not going into surgical field I mm -hmm. always like medicine thinking part and doing my uh, due duties in that sense mm -hmm. so once you figure out that part medical versus surgical then you can see what uh, what kind of medicine or surgery you like mm -hmm. uh, the students who rotate with us in neurology mm -hmm. uh, they rotate neurology and neurosurgery if we are talking about neurosciences right one after each other because there is a lot of difference. It, it is called a bigger picture neuroscience, but mm -hmm. neurology is the medicine part and neurosurgery is surgical, surgical part and that too relating to the brain and the spine. Mm -hmm. So that process starts and then applying for residency, you have to go through USMLE, which is a United States Medical Licensing Examination. Mm -hmm. It has three steps. First one is step one, then step two has two parts, step two CK and step two CS, and the third one is step three. Mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a big thing. He, uh, people talk about, hey, how much scores you got. Score is a big thing. It, it is a competitive exam, I would say. Mm -hmm. It's nerve-wracking. It's very stressful to go through. But if you strive through that process mm -hmm. really well, I think you will ease your process going further. <laughs> so licensing exams do make a difference. <laughs> Shamte, do you have any questions for Dr. Kaur? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I was kind of wondering, um, I've heard a lot of uh, other like family friends experiences with uh, like which classes are going to be most stressful. What I'm gonna, what will I be like looking forward to? What will I be? What's going to stress me out? What am I? What's going to go on in medical school? So I think the most uh, students enjoy, or me looking back, was the first year when you go in medical school. It's all about sciences. You are just reading through. Um, the books you know there's no patient encounters there's nothing like that and then by the end of first year maybe you get bored and you want to see patients you want to see real patients so second year is very enthusiastic you you start seeing patients by the end of second year and and then you start defining your uh, thoughts in in the way where you, you will have some alignment I would say that's that just comes but natural uh, but side by side, you have to start thinking about your steps, which people take by end of second year. They start preparing for their step one of USMLE. So mm -hmm. that kind of, uh, I think, is nerve wracking. But I would say you would enjoy clinical rotations more than just sitting and reading the books. Mm -hmm. let, let, let me ask uh, something. So, so the way uh, Shantesh told us that uh, you know to get into the school to improve your application, it's not just academics, right? You you uh, you know bring other things into the picture. So for uh, selection into residencies and observerships or even clerkships, do they look at uh, anything other than your your scores? Definitely. I would say scores does not matter and that's not the only thing which matters. Mm -hmm. You 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 got to build up your resume or CV, what we call, with observerships, which people do it after they finish medical school, but also while you are doing your clerkships, you can find a good mentor, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I think helps a lot. With mentor, you can have some exchange of thoughts and then thinking about some research, what we, what we can do. Can we go towards clinical research? Can we go towards basic science research? Mm -hmm. I would just say grab any opportunity you get because, uh, and it's a general rule of life, grabbing and recognizing the opportunity. Uh, whatever adds to your resume and whatever entrusts you, mm -hmm. just don't let it go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Something you have. Any follow-ups on that? Any further clarifications? Um, do you think that maybe, like what kinds of research opportunities am I gonna be looking at? Like um, you said like clinical or, uh, I didn't uh, hear the other one. Um, the Those kinds of uh, research opportunities, are they going to like build on my 
the things that I'd be learning in like a college seminar or would there be different information that I'd apply when I'm actually like working in a hospital? So two types of research, as I said, clinical and basic science, which are the broader aspects. Basic science you're gonna get when you're in your medical school, performing with different labs, physiology department, you get to go to those labs. You're mm -hmm. gonna get those opportunities there. Mm -hmm. But when you are doing your clerkships, you're gonna get clinical research experience, unless you have a department, like some people have rotations with the basic science research department included in them so that's different but mostly you have to identify clinical research opportunities while in the hospital and I think the best person or the best people who can guide you will be the current residents mm -hmm. attending the faculty does help uh, but they, they are there for a limited time period and then they have to teach residents and the fellows so the best person, the best friend you can make is the residents in the hospital. They can get you involved in so many research projects because they're also in direct contact with their attendings and their faculty and other departments. Mm -hmm. So that way you can get many opportunities. Are, are those uh, clinical um, research opportunities, uh, are they case study based or would it be like you are mirror, like uh, following like a doctor around and seeing the patients that they're dealing with and how to help them. Sure, so while in clinical hospital setting, we do case reports, we do mm -hmm. case series, we do abstracts. We have our uh, registries, like for example, I'm in strokes, we have stroke regist registry, so we can look up the patients which we are thinking, we, you just have to have an idea what you're going to publish, what is different. Mm -hmm. And you will hear that in rounds in the hospital when you are seeing patients, hey, this is different, this is mm -hmm. not seen regularly. So, so then you go home and research, um, do your research at home on Google or Google Scholar is the mm -hmm. best one, yeah. best platform. And then you see if this is not reported or if this is something new, I should report it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and for a uh, fellowship, is that again a competitive uh, process or anyone gets into that? I would say from my experience out loud, but fellowship is a little easier to get in mm -hmm. compared to residency. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I would say residency, it's like the bottleneck. Mm -hmm. Getting into residency is tougher and once you are in residency and you know what is entrusted to you, what you are interested in, you can get into fellowship. Mm -hmm. uh, doctor, we understand that you are uh, currently in a fellowship uh, program studying uh, stroke, right? Now, now we'll take advantage of that. Can, can you tell us uh, something about stroke? What is stroke? So stroke, uh, we, we joke around, it's called the brain, brain attack. Like okay. people know about heart attacks, but people don't know much about brain attacks. Mm -hmm. It's like brain gets supply of oxygen and nutrients via blood mm -hmm. and when that blood flow is disrupted you get what is called stroke mm -hmm. stroke is like a sudden onset of any symptoms it mm -hmm. has two parts it can be hemorrhagic or ischemic so hemorrhage is 20 percent of all the strokes which is like if there is a rupture of blood vessels mm -hmm. and ischemic forms 80 percent of all strokes which is like if there is clot inside the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. So any which way, if your blood supply is disrupted, disrupting your oxygen and nutrients to the brain, that causes stroke. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to recognize and know about stroke because you will be amazed. It's one of the leading cause of death and mm -hmm. disability throughout the world. Mm -hmm. People don't know much about it. In United States per se, it's the number one cause of disability mm -hmm. and, in, and the fifth leading cause of mortality in United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Doctor, we'll, we'll ask you more about uh, strokes after a short break. So see Vektero the way forward. The way forward is Toda Firtu Swagata, Math or the host Harjot Singh. So, uh, Dr. Kaur, before going to the break, you were uh, telling us about stroke. So, so what are the signs of stroke? How do we know that somebody is having a stroke? So, I always tell my patients and the community out, there is a very nice abbreviation from American Stroke Association, FAST, F-A-S-T. Hmm. F for face, if you see anyone drooping or any asymmetry of the face, 
and it's sudden onset, you, you should doubt or you should consider stroke. Mm -hmm. Anyone out in the community, mm -hmm. A for arm, mm -hmm. arm one side arm numbness, weakness. If someone says, my arm just doesn't feel right or it's, it's really numb, I can't feel my arm or leg, you should suspect stroke, any unilateral laterality. Then as for speech, if someone is talking to you and suddenly their speech is mumbling or they're saying some garbled speech or people say it's it's very slurry mm -hmm. you can't understand their words or you can understand what they're saying mm -hmm. or their speech does not make any sense mm -hmm. it says it's like a word salad mm -hmm. you should suspect stroke mm -hmm. and then t is for time it's time mm -hmm. to call 911 or the emergency services mm -hmm. anywhere and as i said time is brain mm -hmm. you know every second or every minute lost you lose 1.8 mi million neurons okay 1.8 million neurons are lost every minute mm -hmm. a stroke is caused mm -hmm. so it's very important to recognize those symptoms and call EMS mm -hmm. or if the patients are in the hospital we we do our education system uh, for the community and the house staff out there for our nursing mm -hmm. to recognize those symptoms and alarm so, so doctor, uh, all four of them, uh, all, all three symptoms show up together or it can be any of them? So there are different syndromes of the brain according to the arterial supply, blood supply, which mm -hmm. areas are supplied. Mm -hmm. These are one of the major symptoms, mm -hmm. but there are many symptoms out there like alteration of consciousness, anyone just losing consciousness all of a sudden, vomiting, loss of balance, things like that. They all come in a congregation of symptoms mm -hmm. which we can how the patients present we can think we can judge w where the stroke is caused and which artery is blocked mm -hmm. or ruptured so but these are the main main ones which are easier to be recognized by community mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, you know once we uh, see that somebody is having a stroke, or I, I don't know if the person who's feeling this himself can can take uh, any any steps, any preventive action or something. What, what is it that uh, we should do uh, immediately? Uh, so immediately I would say call the emergency system, 911 for sure, or wherever, which part of the country they are in, which country they are in. Um, people, because I said 80% of strokes are caused by clot, in the blood vessels so people tend to say and we say that take aspirin mm -hmm. if you have at home um, if that's a bleeding stroke then obviously hospital system is go is the one which where you can get a diagnosed which type of stroke it is mm -hmm. but yeah taking a aspirin so it, can it, help so if, if I talk uh, if I ask you so what is it that we can do to prevent is aspirin one of the things so prevention is a complete different part of stroke which we talk there are four levels of prevention as okay. we know primordial prim, primary secondary and tertiary mm -hmm. so i would i would say to everyone just taking care of your health mm -hmm. simple ways to take care of your health is like checking your blood pressure mm -hmm. just managing your blood pressure and uh, keeping it in normal range can decrease your chances of stroke by 50 percent that's mm -hmm. a huge number mm -hmm. or maybe more than that right and then checking your cholesterol mm -hmm. at day i mean uh, based, like six monthly or so or mm -hmm. if you have bad cholesterol keep that in normal range with medications like statins mm -hmm. checking for diabetes that's very common mm -hmm doing exercise eating healthy diet these days dash diet mediterranean diet they're out and they do help dash diet diet for hypertension mm -hmm. just taking low sodium eating taking servings of fruits and vegetables that does help so just simple ways of taking care of your health mm -hmm. reducing weight mm -hmm. that that's that's very easy things to say um, tougher to do but mm -hmm. but they do help they do make a difference mm -hmm. just controlling these measures Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure uh, Shantej would be coming up with new ideas and uh, Shantej do you have uh, anything you would like to ask Dr. Kaur? Uh, yeah there's actually one question I've been meaning to ask you and it's uh, how is your uh, experience with uh, medicine and all the studies that you've been doing how has it affected your relationship with Sikhi in terms of how maybe the ideas might contradict or support the ideas 
So medicine per se, I think I feel very blessed to have chosen this field. Um, service to God is service to humanity. My father used to say that, used to teach me that always. And that was, I think, my first l line in my personal statement. Mm -hmm. So per se medicine, Pai Kanaya Ji, or Gursiki, and everything teaches that. So medicine per se for sure. But being in neurology also, I think I feel blessed because that's written and taught in our Gurbani you should have control of your mind and still be living your life. You should be meditating on God and living, leading your life in a society. That's taught in our Gurbani and by our gurus, but I think that's where neurology comes into play because our daily life is formed of three modalities maybe. One is uh, thinking from our frontal lobes, right? Thinking. Uh, thought process and all and then second is emotions and then third combining those two which way you are going to go mm -hmm. right so I think that comes from neurology because all your whole of your body is controlled by your brain I, I, I always say uh, to my husband neurons over nephrons cerebrals over coronaries but this is true a whole of your body is controlled by your brain and if you know as our guru said uh, if you know how to control your mind man jite jag jit, man jite jag jit, mm -hmm. there is a way forward mm -hmm. there's uh, you know there is bright light so neurology being in neurology, I feel really blessed. Mm -hmm. And closer to Sikhi, as in you are, you just want to keep your mind in control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, as as a follow up uh, uh, on that, the, the, the recent uh, researchers which which uh, tell us that neurons control uh, our our reaction to uh, circumstances, right? They they control our temper, our attitude, and uh, and all that stuff. And I don't know if uh, Shamtej is is getting to that, uh, because uh, we see that vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, hukum and controls. Uh, uh, but but, but I, I, I would understand maybe the way your neurons uh, are structured is, is something that might be controlled by some uh, supernatural power uh, as well, right? So um, there is our primitive brain and there's modernized brain. Mm -hmm. Primitive brain is like limbic system mm -hmm. and modern, maybe more modern brain is like your frontal lobes mm -hmm. and there's feedback system. So you, your basic ids are coming from your limbic system, aggression, um, any reaction. If, if a child hits you, you, you tend to hit the child back, but then your frontal lobes kick in, hey, no, you, you are a mature person. The child doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where controlling and pushing and giving negative feedback mm -hmm. to that primitive brain mm -hmm. is it's 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 very uh, peculiar to hum human brain. Mm -hmm. It's it's not there in animal brains. Mm -hmm. So th so that's that's very you, we should be proud of, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's that, that's that, uh, that's where they. Uh, say maybe the, uh, the superior position held by a human being uh, amongst all uh, living beings. Uh, Dr. Kaur uh, Shantej is a young bright boy who is just starting his um, you know, path into the medical uh, field. What advice would you like to give him at this stage? So I would say first of all be comfortable in what you have chosen. Mm -hmm. I can say from my experience you are in right field. <laughs> it's the best field you can serve humanity, being a Sikh, what the Sikh meaning is. It's bringing into action the meaning of Sikh. And just be ready that r going forward, uh, medicine is not easy. And the way it's formed in that sense is because you are taking care of other human beings so they have to grill you it's going to be physically emotionally uh, very stressful but also at the end of all your training period you will feel so confident and you will just enjoy it mm. when you treat your patients and you, you know it, it becomes a reflex you do not have to think of certain things it becomes a reflex the way we are trained in the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Raksha, thank you very much for, for those uh, words. We want to say to our viewers that if you want to reach out to Shamtej or you want to reach out to Dr. Kaur, ask questions about the process, Kime in a school which uh, a uh, admission milieu is the key process siga and uh, if you want to uh, you know learn anything from uh, Dr. Kaur, uh, the emails thale uh, displayed hand, you can reach out to them, you can ask your questions. Shantej, Dr. Ko, thank you very much for taking out your time. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. AC Sada episode. So see, Victor, the way forward.